Welcome to Step Into the Story. Incredible conversations of how the Bible changes lives, changes families, and changes communities across the globe. And here's your host, Phil Tuttle of Walk Through the Bible. Welcome to Step Into the Story. Every time we get together, we have a guest who unfolds his or her life, and um, we get to know them, we get to hear their story, but we also explore the intersection of their story and God's story, and it's in that intersection that usually involves Scripture um, that a lot of times that's where the light bulbs go on of what makes this person tick and um, what might God want to do in my life. And um, this is our second try with Jenny Catron. We tried a few weeks ago, and we had some technical difficulties. So, Jenny, I was already looking forward to our conversation, but now I've had even three weeks or more to anticipate <laughs> it. Thank you um, for being our guest, and welcome to Step Into the Story. Phil, thank you so much. I was excited as well about joining you for this. I'm, I just have such appreciation for the podcast and, and your work, and so I was equally excited and glad we're so far, no technical difficulties. So good stuff. That's all good. good. Stuff. So Jenny, um, you are the founder and CEO of the Foresight Group. Let's just, let's just start there. You do a number of different things. I'm sure we'll explore several of those. But what is the Foresight Group? What is its mission? What does it do? Yeah, yeah. The Foresight Group was really a uh, overflow of my passion through the years of helping leaders be healthy and teams be healthy. I have such a deep love for helping individuals find their sense of calling and giftedness, and then pairing that giftedness with the work inside of the organization that they're a part of. And uh, so that's what Foresight does is we do coaching for individual leaders, and then we work with organizations on the health of their team, the health of their leaders. Um, that happens through all different mechanisms between workshops and training and uh, ongoing consulting. But um, the, our mission is to cultivate healthy leaders to lead thriving organizations. Mm. How, how common is it? Um, I'm asking this question as, as a leader of a, of a ministry of a company. How, how common is it for leaders to want to skip the first half of that equation and go, hey, Jenny, um, we really need you to help us build a thriving organization. And then you have to have that come to Jesus conversation that says <laughs> it's actually got to start with you. How, how common yeah. is that a barrier? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Phil. It's great perspective because that is often how it works and that we focus so much as leaders on the thing we want to accomplish and accomplishing that through our team. And and I I I maybe this is the optimist in me who says I don't think any leader starts out trying to ignore how they're doing or pay attention to their health as a leader. I think we just get so caught up in all the things we're responsible for and the people we're responsible to, and we neglect leading ourselves well. And so you're exactly right. I think many times we get called in because there are, you know, maybe that they did a staff culture engagement survey and the, the results came back, you know, mediocre or poor. And it was kind of this, you know, warning flag that, oh, there's something I need to pay attention to here. Or they're just trying to optimize their team and, you know, do as much as they can because they're passionate about the mission. And then we dig a little deeper and we see, oh, actually, you know, at Max, John Maxwell would say everything rises and falls on leadership. And that just proves itself to be true over and over that the health of the leader influences the health of the team. Mm. I read in your bio that, um, you know, really the focus of the Foresight Group is is helping others lead from their extraordinary best. And, you, you know, a lot of times as leaders, we, we are outward focused. We mm -hmm. are focused on, you know, the broader community that we're trying to serve as well as the team that we're trying to nurture and develop. And, um, you know, sometimes taking a hard look at ourselves, not only can that be troubling and painful at times, but sometimes it's just like, I don't want to be a narcissist. I don't want to, you know, sit there and do a lot of navel gazing. There's there's work to be done. And um, that's right. I, I can imagine sometimes that's probably, you just got to say, just trust me. I've done this a few times. This is this is where we need to start. Start. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, I, 
I appreciate what you say there because I do think that sometimes as leaders, we're afraid that to be self-aware, to focus on our growth and development can sometimes feel selfish because we feel the responsibility for all the things we're entrusted with as leaders. And in fact, if we have a healthy perspective of leadership, right? Like uh, my, like, I'll just try to quickly like unpack this a little bit, but for me, leadership begins with influence. That word influence means the power to change or affect someone. And if you think about that definition, the power to change or affect someone, that's significant, right? Like how I lead and how I influence others, if it can change or affect the life of someone else, that could be for the positive or it could be to the negative, depending on how I steward that influence. So their leadership in, in and of itself is sacred work, right? It is like, it is a sacred sacred privilege to have the power to change or affect the life of somebody else. And so if I'm not in a healthy place and I recognize there's a ripple effect of me just not even, you know, being like grossly unhealthy, but just not super, not, not super healthy, not attending to what's going on with me. How am I doing? How am I leading myself? The ripple effect of that could change or affect the lives of the people that I lead in a, in a, in a negative way. So me taking care of myself as a leader is not really selfish if I realize its purpose is for the ripple effect of my influence to be positive to those around me. So there's a little bit of like framing and belief about leadership that I think we have to have in order to um, commit the time and the energy and sometimes the, the difficulty of of looking at, hey, how am I doing? What's going on with me? And bringing in voices that give me perspective on my health as a leader. Mm, that's really good. And, you know, that's t- taking the time to do that is one of the things I think that can close the gap between our professional life and our personal life too. Because, you know, where, whereas we can say, well, you know, at, at, at work, this is my job and it's about other people. And, and yet at home, you can't fake that half of it. And that's right. You know, the worst thing in the world would ever be that, that my kids would go, well, okay, that's like the public dad. Um, he's yes. not the same as like the home dad. Um, and, and really, if you're leading from an extraordinary self, as, as you call it, your best self, your authentic self, that helps avoid that disconnect because, uh, man, my kids, at least, they're 34 and 31 now, but even at a young age, they just had an amazing sense of, of you know, that this has got to be the same person going to our baseball games, our softball it's games, huge. hanging out, helping with homework, as we see in the pulpit on Sunday or, or on a video series. And um, by yeah. God's grace, I mean, Ellen and I sure were far from perfect, but um, I think somebody got those ideas that you are communicating in my heart a long time ago. And Mm -hmm. I I certainly appreciate that. Walk Through the Bible came out with a new course last year. It's it's actually on the life of Moses, and um, it's being translated into a bunch of languages around the world now. But it's called Rescue, Leading Yourself and Others to Freedom. And um, it's being picked up even. It's, It's helpful for folks who are in rehab or leading others through that process, but it's, it's, uh, we almost named it, you know, uh, uh, let's see, a leader worth following or something like that. Cause there is such a, there is such a just drought of authentic leadership, but, but we said, no, that'll lock too many people out of it, but it's leading yourself and others to freedom. And the whole mm-hmm. first session is that, is that freedom must be experienced before it can be shared. And, you know, Uh the long process of preparation in the life of Moses before he was ready, you know, to do something on a public platform. And um, I just see that syncing up with with what you're seeing, saying so much. Um, I've been stalking you online significantly. Uh (laughs) Um, Tell me me about the book, The Four Dimensions of Extraordinary Leadership, just in – in a paragraph or two each, what are those four dimensions and why are each of them so important? Yeah, Phil, the, that book was really a, it was kind of the journey of leadership for me. I, I tell the story in the book of a a leader in my early, so my, my um, 
history is I spent about a decade in the Christian music business, working on the business side. Then I went into ministry and was in ministry for another 12 to 15 years before I started Foresight. And I had a leader in my early years say to me, Jenny, if you want to work with people, you're going to have to learn to love them, to lead them. And again, just one of those gifts of somebody who spoke into my life really early. I was in my mid twenties, probably early to mid twenties. And he set me on this journey to really try to discover and figure out what is great God honoring leadership look like? Like, what does love look like in leadership? And so what you find in the book is kind of that journey for me of, in many ways, trying to come up with some fabulous formula for leadership. And it boils down to, I was, I was in the scriptures. I was studying the life of Jesus. I felt like that was what God was prompting me to do was like, look at the life of Jesus. How did he lead? And so I'm, I'm camped out in the gospels and I get to Mark 12 and, you know, Jesus is getting the questions about taxes and resurrection and, you know, they're throwing those zingers at him. And then they say, what's the, what's the greatest commandment of all? And he says, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And I was just praying and processing and looking that th- at that through the lens of leadership. Here's the, the great commandment I probably learned in second grade Sunday school, right? And what would that mean to leadership? And so that's what I begin to unpack in the book is, is if, we're, if leadership is really about loving others, like if that's like our posture, love God and love others, how do I do that in leadership? And so then I looked at those four, those four words, because it says, love the Lord, your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, I got curious. Why, why that clarification? Mm. Why the distinction? Jesus could have just said, love God, love others, right? You know, end of story, but he clarifies with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and the implication as I studied that is that it means to love God and love others with our whole being. Yes. And so the question for me was, okay, so how do I show up as a leader? And love others with my whole being, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so in brief, because I've already said more than what you asked me to say. but That's all right. This is good stuff. In brief, it's heart is that relational side of leadership that we can't lead if we don't have relationship. If we haven't like slowed down enough to see people, to see who they are as humans, the unique giftedness of who they are and build that relationship. Soul is that spiritual side that, that, our, our, our faith ought to inform our work. So whether we're in a Christian context where we can be overt about our spiritual leadership or whether we're in a marketplace setting where I might not be able to be overt, but, but my faith, if the, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, if those things are showing up, they speak volumes, right? They, they communicate a lot. Yes. Um, Mind is the strategic side. So there is, as leaders, there are plans and strategies and decisions we have to make and um, stewardship decisions and, you know, we, that we have to engage as we lead. And so that's usually the more obvious one. And then strength in this context, I likened to vision because what does scripture tell us that without vision, people perish. And so as leaders, we give strength to those we lead by providing vision, providing hope for where we're going. And so you know, you can, tons more to unpack in that, but my, my philosophy or my framework for leadership um, became rooted in the great commandment and applying those four things to how I lead. Mm, I'm definitely going to read that. Um, for those of you who are listening, it's called the four dimensions of extraordinary leadership. And I just love how grounded in scripture that is. And at the same time, how practical that is and how those, those four areas are really broad, a lot a lot more yeah. broad than four words would lead us to at first believe, you know, just at first glance yeah. of it. Um, yeah, I feel like I keep learning from it. I feel like God keeps revealing new things to me as I think about leadership and I look at it through those four dimensions. Like, how, sure. do, how do I show up with all of, all of those four? Hmm. So um, interesting career that you have landed on. And, um, you know, as you said, good experience in a, in a couple of great churches, Menlo Church and Cross Point Church, um, as, as well as in the Christian music industry. But let's go back even before that. I mean, I don't know many people who, as second graders, go, you know what, someday I'm going to do, I'm going to coach leaders. 
<laughs> I, I'm going to be a consultant. Um, <laughs> right. what, what were you into as a little kid? And tell us some about the family, the home you grew up in. Yeah, yeah. Um, fabulous, like just story and journey and just how you see God weave things together. But I grew up in uh, north central Wisconsin. My family came to faith when I was about eight years old. And so the church and and um and salvation like were distinct for me. So I can I say I grew up in the church, and yet because I started attending church as an eight-year-old and then you know was deeply connected to our local church. But but my family came to faith at eight. And at that point, my parents had already been divorced. You know, we had had some very tumultuous years. And so like the the gift of grace, the gift of salvation was distinct as an eight-year-old. Like it was meaningful to me. I knew something radically shifted in our home as a result of that. And so there's a very distinct marker that happened that I was old enough to be conscious of and yet young enough to then have the privilege to still grow up inside the local church. So uh, so that's a little bit of just kind of the distinctness of our story. Yeah, and, and, and not to interrupt you, but but the fact that there was that line in the sand where mm-hmm. you could say this is before Christ, this is after Christ, and and you saw a radical difference in those who were closest to you and how it affected your world. I mean, I can see how just that experience would would put in your mind Jesus Christ makes a big difference and not yeah. just on Sunday morning, but in all areas of life. And I, I think, I'm not sure how conscious you are even of this, but, but in your podcasts and, and in your writings, your articles, different things, that, that conviction, Jenny, comes mm. across strong. And oh, wow. um, I, you know, you're taking us back to that moment and saying it was really seminal and influential in this. But I think it's probably even stronger than you realize mm. because there was that clear demarcation of it does make a difference and it should in your life too. So sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but I just wanted no, to highlight that. No, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, no, I'm really grateful for it in that uh, it, it is, it's very, it's very like vivid to me that that transition point in our family story. So we got very involved in the local church. You know, I was, I was the kid that volunteered for everything. So I'm a firstborn a type overachiever, you know? So it's like, you know, if there's something that needs to be done, I'm going to show up, I'm going to do it really well. And so I got pushed into lots of opportunities. Um, I don't think that I would have known, you know, like looking at my journey and, and the opportunity to invest most of my time and energy into leadership. I didn't know the word leadership as a kid. Um, but I was, I was a leader. I was, you know, I was a kid that was, I was a little shy and a little reserved because I'm an introvert by nature, but people saw things and called it out in me like over and over again. I think God just put people in my life that, that really drew the best out of me. I had a, we called him uncle Tom. He was, he, I don't know that he was technically an uncle. He was like the great uncle that everybody called uncle Mm. Tom, but he, he played piano and organ at our local church. And he knew I had an interest in music. So he gave me free uh, piano lessons and voice lessons. And then he'd have me sing special music in our, you know, our church on Sunday night. And, but I credit him with helping me get comfortable on the stage. Mm. And now as a communicator, as a speaker, every time I get on a stage, I think of uncle Tom and just that belief he, he had in me. And then there was, um, you know, I, I was leading our VBS program as like a 12 year old because we were a small little country church and, you know, they didn't have hardly anybody to take on these responsibilities. And I remember I was leading VBS as like a 12 year old and, you know, it was a blast. I had, I had fun. I learned, I figured it out. And so my, I think so much of my life is marked by that kind of thing where somebody would say, Hey, Jenny, will you do this? And I would just say yes. And then I would figure it out. And, you know, and now looking back on reflection, I see the leadership opportunities that I was given, but I wasn't, I didn't know to seek them out. I just was kind of following those, you know, those, the belief that others had in me Mm -hmm. and then kind of finding where I really resonated and where my gifts flourished through that, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so easy. Everybody wants to know which spiritual gift inventory is the most helpful and you know, I mean, there's there's a number of them, and and some of them are really good, 
But so many of those track experience and then go, oh, oh you right. did this, so there must be a gift there. And how often is it so much more reliable when somebody else says, hey, Jenny, I see something in you, even if they don't articulate it, I think you should do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we kind of go, okay, I respect your view, so I'll try it. And, and then some of those end up, you drill some dry wells, and others mm -hmm. of them, you hit gushers and go, wow, there was fruit there, and, and I experienced joy doing that. And I just like that organic approach to spiritual gifts, because ultimately the body of Christ is not just a, a, an organization. It is a body. Yeah. It is a living thing. That's right. Your, your experience, uh, I just, I so resonate with that. That's beautiful the way <laughs> that you're explaining it. Um, so you didn't stay at that home forever. Eventually, um, off to school. Where, where'd you get yeah. your education? Yeah. So I, so this is just one of those funny parts of the story that you know, I, so I had an interest in music and my family was a bit conservative on what I could listen to. And so I was mostly listening to Christian music. And, uh, I remember I was probably in middle school and there was a, I was listening to DC talk. If you remember when DC sure. talk was all the rage and it was a back of a CD. So here I'm dating myself, but there's a back of a CD and I see this company called forefront records on the back of it. And I thought, huh, I wonder what they do. I want to work there. And I just kind of like made a declaration that I was going to go work for Forefront Records, that that's where I wanted to work. It's what I wanted to do. I didn't really understand what they did or what happened, but I knew that they did something that allowed this music to be in my hands as a consumer. So that was all I needed to know. And that was, I was fixated on that as my goal. So I started my education. So I, you know, so I'm a small town kid raised in uh, rural Northern Wisconsin. None of my immediate family had gone to college. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have, I didn't have a lot of support in knowing how to get to school. So I just started, and this is back before the internet. So I'm just sending, you know, those postcard things off to every Christian college that I could find somewhere in Tennessee and getting all the information back. And I ended up landing on Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee, small Christian liberal arts school that I, I started there. I did two years there. And I got a number of scholarships in their music program, and it was a small school, so it felt really comfortable to me because I was didn't know a soul. I move a thousand miles from home and don't know a soul, but uh, it was a really great spot for me to land. And um, uh, and then I ended up getting an internship at Forefront Records, and I completed my degree at Middle Tennessee State University because I I was already in the door sure. at Forefront and. I finished school and and worked at the same time. You know, th this is crazy. Uh, last week I was speaking at a, a camp meeting. I didn't even know those still existed anymore. Existed, up in that's Pennsylvania. funny. Pennsylvania flew flew into Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Flight was late. R rental car place was closed. By the time we got there, we called Uber. And Jenny, you're not going to believe this. This guy picks us up. Um, driving an Uber. His, his name's John, and he's from South Sudan, and we're kind of interviewing his, his story out of him while he takes us to the hotel. We didn't go to the camp till the next day, and uh -huh. um, found out, I'm like, well, how did, how did you get here to the States? And he goes, I got a scholarship from Bryan College in Tennessee. You are kidding. No, no, <laughs> and um, turns out, like, like one of my daughter's good friends from high school had gone to Brian. This guy knew him and, oh, and all of that. Goodness. So, and now I'm here in Brian college from you too, but it's, it's just, um, uh, it's just wild how, how all roads are leading to Dayton, Tennessee all of a that's, sudden in my life. Isn't that a crazy story? That's crazy. Cause yeah, it's a small school. Like, you know, it, it you don't bump into it that often. So that is fantastic. I love it. Yeah. So, um, Oh, so many more things I, I want to talk to you about. We'll, we'll do some of that after a quick break. Um, but we've got lots more to talk about. Do you need rescue? Rescue from fear, loneliness, addiction, feelings of inadequacy, fear that people are going to discover the real you? Can you help someone else find freedom? Walk with us as we discover the life of Moses in our new Bible study, Rescue, 
leading yourself and others to freedom. From 40 years of preparation in the wilderness, to 10 plagues, to leading God's people out of Egypt, to the Ten Commandments, to dealing with the people's complaints and their disobedience, and more, we will learn how God rescued Moses from his fears and feelings of inadequacy, and how God worked in and through Moses to lead himself and God's people to freedom. And welcome back. I told you we had a lot more to talk about with with Jenny. I don't want to waste any time on that. One of, one of the things that I that I noticed um, in your bio is Jenny loves a fabulous cup of tea, great books, learning the game of tennis, and hiking with her husband. Um, develop those. I mean, I mm. know your schedule is busy. You travel a lot. Um, you're, you know, you squeezed us in for this podcast that I appreciate. But what do you do that rebuilds yourself? Uh, oh. You described yourself as a as an introvert. I also am an introvert by nature, and God's called both of us to really public ministers. Yeah. And yeah, that's God great. and I defeated, uh, debated that for a long time because <laughs> I'm like, Lord, you just, this makes no sense at all. A lot of people, if you're not an introvert, you don't get it that introverts love people. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people go, oh, extroverts love people, introverts, they don't. That's absolutely not true. But but there is a drain right. in, yeah. in giving yourself away to other people. What is your pattern for for rebuilding into you. Because there's like, I tell people there's two kinds of batteries. There's the battery that you can just put on the quick charge and, you know, one good night's sleep and I'm ready to go again. Um, but then there's there's other times when you've given so much out mm-hmm. that you got to put it on the trickle charge for the, yeah. for the slow charge. What do you do for quick charge and what do you do for slow trickle charge? Uh, such a good question. And this is, this has been a learning for me, Phil, because you do live in that tension of wanting to pour out and invest in. And when you have a, a role like I do, where it's very engaging with others, that it almost does back to our self-leadership things. At times, it will feel a little selfish to need the rejuvenation. And what I've learned is that as my as my responsibilities have continued to grow and my work has continued to be very uh you know, very extroverted, very engaged with others, I've had to be even more disciplined about my recharging. So to answer your question, my, my daily rhythm, uh, I get up early, I immediately go for a run or a walk. I need, and it preferably outside. I mean, I live in Wisconsin and I will, I will be outside pretty much all year long. There's usually about two weeks in January that I Mm -hmm. about can't do it. But beyond that, I put the gear on and I go, I need the fresh air. I connect with God in nature. Like, so being outside is really, really significant to me. So I'm out of the door for a run or a walk every morning. Um, then I come back and I have usually at least an hour, sometimes more than that hour to an hour and a half in quiet time, reading, reflection, journaling. Uh, I just need like good, thoughtful time to sit and not be hurried in. I can turn reading into another or even quiet time into another check the box activity. Sure, and so I or need what can I get for this group that I'm scheduled to talk to and bypass yes. that internalization. Yep. 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 So if I don't have enough slow time to sit in it, uh, it, it becomes another task or, you know, just part of the regular rest of my work function. So that's my daily routine. I'm also really disciplined, at, particularly when I'm at home. If I'm on the road, it's a little harder. Um, but when I'm home, by 5, 5.30, I'm shutting everything down. And I, I physically, my husband laughs at me. My office is you know, upstairs in our home. And I shut everything down. I put everything in my laptop bag. And I take my bag and I, like, I go home. <laughs> and I'm in the same house, but I physically pack things up like I would if I were in the office and I, 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 I go home for the night and I don't reopen it uh, barring an exception. And so I have real clear, like I shut off and then it's make dinner and hang out with my husband and, you know, just kind of relax in the evening. Um, so I'm pretty disciplined about that. Hey, let's, so that stay, re- let's stay on that one for a minute because for so many people, 
during COVID, the any kind of boundary between work and home was just blown away. And That's you know, right. while a lot of people loved being able to work from home and those things, um, there's no more commute. I mean, yeah. I, I live in Atlanta and we have crazy traffic. Thankfully, I'm only 18, 20 minutes from the office. But there's such value in that time for switching gears. I got to take that hat off now. And and my wife and even our kids were always wonderful about going, ooh, dad, um, you know, why don't you just write us a memo about that, you know, (laughs) because... Because you're, you're still in, 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 in work mode. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll send you an email about that. But, um, uh-huh. you know, uh-huh. the fact that, that that clear boundary of, of geography yes. has been broken yeah. down for a lot of people. We love parts of that. I mean, I worked at home this morning and had no interruptions, and it was glorious. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you are kind of artificially creating that boundary – um, just stay on that topic for a yeah. minute because there are a lot of people who are not navigating that very well now. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's texting about work at all hours. It's, yes. Um, what do you do? What are some of the other ways that you establish a boundary between yeah. your work and your home life? Yeah. And I feel like, and you're exactly right, Phil, because we hear this from so many of the leaders that we get to work with. And I think I had to figure it out when I started Foresight six years ago. It forced me to figure out how do I do this, you know, before all the rest of us had to figure it out in COVID. And obviously other people have done this, navigated this too. But I, and I probably stumbled into it, but it was this recognition of, you you know, when you do go into an office, there are those, the, the commute, the, there's habits and behaviors that, and there's, there's science around this, I'll butcher it, but there's science around talking about how those habits and behaviors prep your, prep your mind for what you're doing next. And, you know, the, and you, you're, you build those rhythms and then, you know, it, if you don't have the mechanisms that help you turn it off, you won't turn it off. And so those different behaviors, so that's why you'll hear people talk about, hey, If you're working from home, get up, take a shower, put real clothes on, like, you know, and have to like do everything that you would do if you were going to go to the office, um, because it's helping, it's helping trick your brain into the, oh, now I switch to work mode and then vice versa. I shut everything down. I close it all up. I take my bag. I walk downstairs. Um, when I, and when COVID first happened and I wasn't traveling quite as much, I would literally shut everything down. I would go downstairs and then I would take a walk around the yard as my Mm. evening commute (laughs) Um, because I was still, you know, and I think just a little bit of extra like stress and anxiety, I needed to do just a walk around the yard, pick a few weeds, you know, like just kind of enjoy the scenery to, to switch gears, to go be present at home. Mm. And it doesn't have to be a lot, but I think just a little, a few of those things that create the habits. And I was saying earlier, my husband laughs at me because like, I could be walking out the door to go to work, but instead I'm just walking up the stairs. Like I, everything is on as if I were going to, you know, meet you at the office, you know? Um, So I think just figuring out what are those things for you? What are the habits you did when you went to an office and how can you replicate something similar at, you know, if you're working from home, uh, again, just helps, helps you have those on and off switches Mm. internally that have been helpful for me. In your company, I mean, what, with your team, what kind of boundaries do you try to create in terms of like communication off hours? And um, I mean, my cell phone is the greatest productivity tool I can ever imagine. It is also the longest leash Yes. Where anywhere in the world, and it's a bungee cord leash, where it yes. can like jerk me out of wherever I am and snap me back in into office mode. How do you personally deal with that? Yeah. Oh, and that's another big question. Um, first of all, I think every team and every leader need to be clear about what communication tools we use so and how and when. So I'll give you an example for us at Foresight, because my team is all remote. Everybody lives all over the country and everybody's hours might be a little bit different based upon, you know, their scope of responsibility. And so we have a general understanding that, you know, 
everybody is only expected to respond in like typical office hours, nine to five office hours is when we should, we, sh we can expect to hear from each other. Um, email is used for communication that requires, you know, more information or details, um, but we're not expected. In fact, we're discouraged from checking it outside of typical office hours. Um, we have a Slack channel where we just message, you know, random information and details all day long. I encourage my team to put their Slack channel on um, quiet mode during, you know, because you can you can manage those hours. So right. don't Slack during, you know, outside of normal office hours. We use text or phone sparingly. It's more for urgent things. So we're only texting if it's something more critical or more urgent. Yeah, and you as really we just lose have... the trail of that too. That totally. I, I mean, so many times I've been like, I, I know I talked to this person about that and I'll search my email and I won't find it. And then, you know, it's how many it's an, layers back in a text and you can't access yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, it's not actionable. You, you don't know where it is. So I think just being clear about which tools we use and when, and then expectations. So another thing I had to do, Phil, because I will travel, you know, and, and I might be in a different time zone. I might be, you know, I might be working late one evening because I was with a client all day. And so I'm finally checking my email. So I also had to just, I have to communicate to my team, hey, you may occasionally get an email message from me at random times of the day. I do not expect you to look at it. In fact, I hope you are not opening your email outside of your regular office hours. You might get messages from me, but I have no expectation of a response mm. until the next business day. Mm. Because sometimes I'm going to work at random rhythm. So it's on me as the leader to communicate that I'm not expecting them to jump anytime that I'm, you know, popping into their inbox, you know, at a random hour. So just by the nature of our work, I, we, I just, my team just understands, Hey, if she's emailing at 10 PM at night, it might be because she's actually on the West coast and it's only eight o'clock for her. And she just right. finished a dinner meeting and she's just doing a few follow-up things so that we can keep so moving you don't tomorrow. Forget, but it doesn't yeah. mean I'm expecting a response now. And I, yeah. this was worth the whole conversation. And I think our team is probably going to appreciate that. I heard some of those things from you. So <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I know that's a topic that you dealt with in one of your recent podcasts on, you know, navigating a hybrid work environment. And, yeah. um, you know, that leads me to one of the final things I just want to ask you about your podcast called Lead Culture. Um, mm -hmm. Give our give our listeners uh, just a thumbnail sketch of what that is and what you're hoping to accomplish by it. Sure. Yeah. I just want to elevate the conversation around leadership and culture and particularly the culture of teams, you know, the, and, and we're hearing more and more of this, you know, I think there's just a heightened awareness because the workplace, uh, the workplace culture is so, is shifting so much with the great resignation and people reevaluating their work and why they do it and more expectations of hybrid work. Like there's just a lot that's shifting in how teams connect. And I think some of it is good. And I think some of it is, uh, potentially not so good. I think our connection, our, our um, respect and trust for one another, um, I think the camaraderie of teams is being impacted because of lack of proximity to each other. And, um, and so I think it's really important that leaders are keeping a pulse on how's my team doing? How, you know, what's the health of my team? Um, I define culture as who we are and how we work together. So are we clear on who we are? Like the the, the heart, the spirit of this team and what we're called in a, to do together. And then how do we do that? What are the values that guide how we work together? And that's a big crux of the work we talk about are the, the values that guide how we behave as a team. Because it's my belief, Phil, that um, if leaders are healthy and if team cultures are healthy and thriving, we're going to accomplish that mission. We're, you know, like the ability to achieve the work that we feel called to do as a team and as a leader and as an organization, we will, that will happen if we're healthy and united as a team, but it's on the leader to be paying attention to the culture. How are we doing? Um, are we clear about how we're working together? How do I get a team that's aligned and achieving the mission in a, in an effective way? And I have just such a passion for it because at this, the heart of it, I think culture 
is the stewardship of people in pursuit of a mission. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm, you know, I'm interviewing people. Sometimes I'm just ranting on a thought of, of, of culture, but um, the purpose of the podcast is to really elevate that conversation and help leaders be equipped to build great teams. Mm. Uh, who, who said um, culture eats strategy? Strategy for, for breakfast. For breakfast. It's, yeah, it's often um, credited to Drucker, yeah. um, Peter Drucker. I think there's, there's, there's debates about whether it was initially him, but he usually gets most credit for it. Yeah, yeah. and then I've heard it also eats strategy for lunch. And I mean, apparently yeah. culture has quite an appetite. I, I, <laughs> the other day, I was just kind of writing some stuff down. I looked, I looked at what I had written, and it, it was something like um, people, people will come to a company because of the benefits package um, or in, in ministry, possibly because of the mission, but, right. but they stay, they stay with the company because of culture. And, That's right. Um, I, it's just, I don't think it can be overemphasized. And, and Jenny, of, of all the work that the Foresight Group does, I think that emphasis on culture, well, it, it's every bit, it's got to start with a healthy leader and, you know, and that's your focus. But then what kind of an environment, um, who are we, how do we do it? Those things consistently in the Bible, you know, God seems to say, I care every bit as much how and why you do things as what you do. And in this that's very good. pragmatic world of ours that the end justifies the means and we see it in politics and we see it in business and we even see it in home life and mm -hmm. and yet god says no no part of loving with your whole heart is the why the motivation of it all and i just i resonate so much with what you're saying and i my prayer for you jenny is that god would just open up more and more mm. opportunities of influence for you, you because because in some ways uh, you're this unique blend of kind of pastoral because it's like, you all really know this is true and you need to <laughs> listen, you know, to this. But there's also a prophetic edge to it that says, mm -hmm. no, this is thus saith the Lord. This works because God designed us and he's given us the secrets to that in this book called the Bible. And, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of, of your client, you're right. Sometimes you can quote chapter and verse. Other times... You just lead on a principle level, but God's truth is still God's truth. And um, if if right. people want to learn more about your ministry or maybe even consider bringing you into to their company, what's the best way for people to track with you and get in touch with you? Yeah, Phil. Well, first of all, thank you so much for just the opportunity to spend time with you and 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 talk today. This was fantastic. Um, I would love to connect with folks, even if it's just to you know hear what's going on in your story and in your organization or leadership. But the best way to reach me is our website is getforesight.com. It's the word get, G-E-T, the number four in the word site, S-I-G-H-T, getforesight.com. Um, you can connect with us there. Lots of great information, free resources, links to the podcast, articles, et cetera. Um, any way that we can serve leaders, we are so eager to. Yeah, and I really would encourage you to check out the Lead Culture podcast and um, tap into Jenny's wisdom some more. Jenny, thank you so much for being a guest here uh, with me on Step Into the Story. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you for joining us for the Step Into the Story podcast, powered by Walk Through the Bible. We'd love to hear what you think by giving us a review on iTunes or Google Play. Also, don't miss a single episode by clicking the subscribe button. If you'd like more resources to help you explore and live God's word in your daily life, visit walkthrough.org. That's W-A-L-K-T-H-R-U dot O-R-G. Walk through the Bible. Take a walk. Change the world.